My name is Brian Jackson. I'm an associate professor of pathology at the University of Utah and VP and uh, chief medical informatics officer at Air EP Laboratories. Now, I suspect that most of you watching this presentation are familiar with the reality TV concept of a makeover. Originally, this started on morning shows like Oprah, where they'd do beauty makeovers, give someone a new wardrobe, new hairstyle, etc. Or maybe they'd do a home makeover, where they'd redecorate a room, bring in new furniture, new carpeting, etc. A few years ago, ABC took this up a notch with their idea of extreme makeovers. So the personal makeovers involved plastic surgery and were a bit controversial. But the home makeover has really been very popular. They find some needy or deserving family. They go in and completely demolish their house, and then within a few days build it completely new, gorgeous one that we're all jealous of. So I've actually had some personal experience with this TV makeover concept. Not, unfortunately, the, the ABC Extreme Home Makeover, but about 20 years ago, my wife was a big fan of the Regis and Kathy Lee morning show. A few older people watching might remember. And one day they put out an announcement for a remodeling home makeover contest. We happened to be living in a new, very small, and very hideous home. And, and send in pictures of our house. You can see a couple of them in the before shots here. And they were just depressing enough that we were actually one of the winners here. So this house was about 100 years old, very small, but had some really charming features. And the sad thing was that most of the charming features had long since been covered over. The 11-foot ceilings had been dropped down to 7 feet using industrial ceiling tile. The walls were all covered in this cheap, dark brown fake paneling. There were a couple windows. You can see one on one side of the fireplace, and there's a matching one on the other side of the fireplace that had been boarded over. And then there was another stained glass window over the couch that you can't really see here that was half covered up by the dropped ceiling. The floor was dark brown carpeting, and overall it just created this really dark, not a lot of light, depressing kind of a setting to live in. And by pulling out all of these dark features and pulling out the ceiling, we were able to let in a lot more light and create the opportunity for the after picture you see here. That was the living room. This one's the dining room. The before picture of the dining room, you can't even see anything because it's so dark other than the light coming in through the window. But the transformation of this room was similar. So basically what happened here was that the Regis and Kathy Lee show, together with DuPont, their carpet sponsor, supplied a lot of new nice furniture and wallpaper and carpeting. But the point I want to make here is that simply adding new features, adding new stuff, would not have made for a compelling transformation. We first had to take away the constraints. The drop tile ceiling, the boards over the windows, the hideous dark paneling, and that hideous dark brown carpet. And after we stripped all of that stuff out, we had the opportunity to remake these rooms into some very attractive, friendly, livable spaces. Now, I didn't actually get this makeover definition off the dictionary, I just I made it up. But the point that I want to make is that to do a real makeover, it usually requires some level of demolition, some level of taking away constraints uh, so that it frees you up to create something new and beautiful. What does this have to do with healthcare? I am in just a minute, because this is a lab presentation, going to extend this to laboratories. But let me lead into this by starting with an example from clinical care. Most primary care clinics are dependent on third-party reimbursement, and the basic business model is that you see as many patients per day as you can manage. The doctors refer to it as the primary care hamster wheel because they end up feeling like they're just running from exam room to exam room with barely enough time to talk to their patients, let alone solve their patients' problems. I read a lot of doctor blogs on the Internet, and there are a lot of depressed primary care docs out there who are just really frustrated by this model. They want to do the right thing for their patients. They want to manage their diseases. They want to promote good health. But what they're incentivized to do is to have a lot of visits, which means they can't spend a lot of time on the visits. So what would happen if you stripped away the third-party billing part, just hypothetically? So we've actually run that experiment at AREP Laboratories, where we have an in-house primary care clinic for employees and their families. AIRUP is self-insured, which means there's no reason for our clinic to have to submit insurance claims, and so they don't. What the clinic does instead is obsessively focus on how it can best use its provider's time to benefit the health of the patients. So instead of maximizing the number of visits per day, they're trying to maximize the amount of health benefit. What does that mean in practical terms? One example is that the four mid-level providers handle all the routine care, whereas the two MD family physicians focus on the more complicated patients. Another example is that if a complicated patient needs 30 to 60 minutes to work through something and solve a problem, that can be okay. 
And it's balanced by the fact that a lot of the routine follow-up visits, as well as questions that patients might have that in a normal clinic would generate visits, gets handled by email because that's a lot better use of the provider's time. And then finally, the providers don't spend as much time on the phone with insurance companies filling out claims and, and things like that. They've also come up with some other creative things, such as giving away free glucometers and test strips in the clinic as an incentive to get the diabetics to come in regularly. So the story here, the reason I'm telling this, is that we first had to strip out the constraints, which in this case was the third-party billing and all of the processes and priorities that are downstream of that as implications. And by stripping that out, it freed up the clinic to try doing things in new ways and creating new value. So what's the laboratory analogy here? And you might be able to tell where I'm headed with this. Third-party billing has, in some respects, a similar impact on laboratories as it does on primary care clinics. It pushes us to optimize the things that get paid for. In this case, in our case, the number of performed tests, as opposed to what patients really need, which is proper diagnosis and monitoring. Now, need to be careful here. I do not want to accuse laboratories of not putting the patient first, not caring about patients, not, not caring about the doctors. It's not that. We do care about patients. We care about our customers, the doctors. But we're incentivized to put the number of tests that we perform first and foremost in our business model. So you may be saying at this point, well, okay, theoretically that may be interesting, but is it really relevant? Because we're dependent on third-party billing. We have to have money coming in to afford to do the laboratory services that we provide. Well, yes, you're right, I understand that. But I'm not convinced it's always gonna be that way. So I'd like you to ask yourself as you're watching this, in your laboratory, what percentage of your testing is currently individually reimbursed? My guess is that for most of you, it's probably over half, but probably well under 100%. Inpatient testing, for example, is generally not individually reimbursed because of DRG-based hospital stays. And in the future, the percentage might very well shift downward, particularly if accountable care organizations lead to more capitated lab arrangements. And if that does shift, if you end up finding that maybe 20%, 25% of, of your testing is individually reimbursed, but the rest isn't, what implications would that have? Here's my prediction. When it's the institution paying for your laboratory operations. The institution might be a hospital, might be the health system, but it, when it's institutional funding that covers most of your lab operations, rather than the insurance companies doing it on a fee-for-service basis, this will shift the priorities. Instead of being incentivized to perform and bill the most tests with your amount of resource, now the incentive will be to perform the minimum number of tests necessary to take care of the patient's needs. And the overarching goal becomes improving the full diagnostic process, which means that the analytic function of performing tests will shrink a little bit in priority, but helping doctors order and interpret tests correctly will become a much larger priority. In more detail, more specifically, when the goal enlarges from simply performing the tests to creating diagnostic value to the patient, these are some of the things that I anticipate labs are going to be spending a lot more of their time on. Number one, measurement processes. Do we systematically measure interclinician and interfacility variation in lab test ordering, and do we feed that info back to the medical staff? Probably not in most cases. How about systematically measuring concordance with guidelines and providing corresponding feedback on that to the medical staff? Again, currently, the answer is probably not, but in the future, this is what we're going to get paid to do. Communication processes. Now, I want to be careful here because your individual laboratory, whoever you might be, might have fantastic communication processes. But let's face it, most labs have pretty rudimentary client service functions and pretty rudimentary websites. Surveys that I've seen have shown that when doctors have questions about lab testing, they usually don't attempt to contact the lab. Instead, they tend to go to Google or they go to another doctor at their clinic, or worse, they'll just wing it because getting answers out of the lab is not currently easy enough. So that's something that's going to have to be a priority for us in the future. We laboratorians have a lot of valuable expertise, and we need to make it really easy for the clinicians to tap into that expertise. And then institutional processes. A lot of these are IT processes and policies. In many institutions, at too many institutions, it's the IT people who maintain the test directories and the EMR and not the lab people. And there are consequences of that, negative consequences. 
Clinicians will often maintain their own lab order sets based on their personal preferences without oversight by the laboratory. Again, there are consequences of that, and these are our areas where our expertise can add a lot of value to the diagnostic process. So in summary, I've used the concept of the term makeover here for this talk to emphasize that sometimes in order to make progress, we first need to strip away elements of our current structure, namely the elements that are constraining us. In the case of lab medicine, I personally believe that CPT-based fee-for-service reimbursement of lab tests is a fundamental constraint that's holding us back. I fully realize most labs aren't in a position to jettison third-party billing right now, but I do think there's a good possibility that some of us are going to wake up one of these mornings and realize that it's dropped below 50% of our testing and that it may be rapidly decreasing from there. Although remodeling our lab business and our lab business models isn't going to be easy, remodeling is never easy, I do believe it will open up some exciting opportunities and particularly opportunities to become much more clinically engaged. Thank you.